Hello, my name is Dr. Thomas Bussey. I'm an associate teaching professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at UC San Diego. So today we're going to take a closer look at the role of that catalysts play in chemical reactions. And in particular, we're going to focus in on enzymes. Enzymes are biological catalysts. So you're probably familiar with the function of a catalyst. They speed up a chemical reaction. Enzymes, in fact, often speed up biological reactions by a factor of a million or more. But why would a biological reaction need to speed up in the first place? Well, some reactions are so slow that they would take years to occur in an uncatalyzed state. And that would be a real problem for a living organism. Your body needs to be able to make uh, products quickly and efficiently. If you had to wait around for years, that wouldn't be great for you. You'd, you'd die. <laughs> so, Fast reactions are, are a good thing. In other cases, the product of one reaction is used as the, the reaction or reactant of a subsequent reaction. So your body might need to match the speed of both of those reactions so they can be paired up efficiently. If your first reaction can't produce products fast enough, the second reaction is basically waiting around. And we want to make sure that these two reactions in a particular pathway are really synced up. So in order to understand how enzymes are able to speed up biological reactions, let's start by taking a look at some of the general characteristics of an enzyme. As a catalyst, enzymes are not uh, part of the overall reaction. What that means is that even though they participate in the mechanism of the chemical reaction, their original state is regenerated by the end of the reaction. It would be incorrect to say that they're not changed during the reaction, they, they absolutely are. They participate in the chemical reaction. However, the state that they were in before the reaction is the same state that they're in at the end of the reaction. So they're not included as a reactant or a product in the chemical reaction. Because of this, they can be reused. So when we talk about enzyme catalyzed reactions, we're gonna talk about substrates. And the substrate here is really just a, another word for reactant. We're gonna use the letter S to indicate our substrates. We'll call our products P. That one doesn't really change from general chemistry. And we'll denote our enzyme as E. Quite often when their substrate reacts with the enzyme, we end up forming an enzyme substrate complex. And so we'll call that complex ES to indicate that it's both the combination of the substrate and the enzyme. So quite often we would start with a reaction in uncatalyzed state with the substrate forming product. In an enzyme catalyzed reaction, we have a very similar pathway. However, first the substrate is going to react with the enzyme and it's going to form our enzyme substrate complex. That enzyme substrate complex can go on to form the product that we were originally going to produce and regenerate the enzyme itself. Because they form complexes with the substrates, enzymes carry out reactions one at a time. In other words, they don't catalyze multiple reactions at the same time. Once they've catalyzed one reaction, they can be reused to catalyze a reaction between another group of substrates. Because of this, enzymes are, are an interesting case study of zero order kinetics. In most reactions, as the amount of reactant increases, the rate of the reaction also increases by some factor, right? And so you may have described these as the order of the reaction, first order, second order, et cetera. Commonly, we'll present zero first and second orders as normal reaction orders when we give examples. However, zero order reactions are, are relatively rare. A zero order reaction would indicate a reaction in which as we increase the reactant concentration, no change is occurring in the rate of the reaction. How would that happen? Well, let's consider a diagram or a, a graph here of substrate concentration versus the rate of the reaction. If we look at substrate concentration increasing over time, we can model how the rate of our chemical reaction would occur within a biological system. 
at very low substrate concentrations, an enzyme would basically be waiting around for an enzyme or a uh, substrate to bump into that enzyme to form the product. And so we will get some initial rate of reaction that actually initially en ends up replicating first order kinetics roughly. However, at very high substrate concentrations, basically all of the enzyme is occupied. Once an enzyme becomes available, it's almost immediately reacting with the next substrate molecule. So at sufficiently high substrate concentrations, the reaction rate is independent of the amount of substrate. And the reaction is basically proceeding under zero order kinetics. Some enzymes catalyze reactions involving one specific substrate. Other enzymes catalyze reactions involving groups of substrates. In this case, all of the substrates tend to have similar structural similarities. They all tend to look the same. They undergo the same types of reactions as well. So why can't any molecule just react with our enzyme? Well, enzyme specificity or the ability of the enzyme uh, to select the right substrate is really due to the precise interactions of the enzyme with the substrate. That interaction is the result of the three-dimensional structure of the enzyme. Here, we end up with a really common uh, phrase that you hear in biology and biochemistry that structure determines function. Therefore, the structure of the enzyme and how it interacts with the structure of the substrate really determines what that enzyme can do. The substrate doesn't react with the entire enzyme. Instead, catalysis occurs in an area of the enzyme known as an active site. So if we imagine our enzyme, the sort of this Pac-Man shape, our active site would be this open cleft. First, it's important that the active site and the substrate are roughly complementary in shape. So if our substrate looks like something like this, we get a roughly complementary interaction between the substrate and our enzyme. Why would that roughly complementary shape be necessary? Well, the surface of the substrate needs to be able to interact and get close to the surface of the enzyme's active site. Why? Well, because there needs to be a proper substrate interaction between the enzyme itself, the enzyme and the substrate in order to form this enzyme substrate complex. We can model this with a few different uh, examples. Back in 1890, Emil Fischer was the first to propose what's known as the lock and key analogy for an enzyme substrate interaction. This model assumes that a non-flexible enzyme has the shape that's almost directly complementary to a non-flexible shape of a substrate. Essentially, they fit together like a lock and a key. This is more or less what I've drawn in this image. However, in uh, 1958, Daniel Koshlin proposed a modified model known as the induced fit model. This model assumes that the enzymes are flexible and that they can assume a shape that is complementary to that of the substrate when it binds. In the induced fit model, both the enzyme and the substrate can change shape or mold to each other. They don't necessarily start off with shapes that are not directly complementary to each other, but they become more complementary as they interact. Think of it like a hand in a glove. The, the glove is approximately or roughly the, the same shape as the hand and complementary to that, but not exactly. But as the two interact with each other, the shape of the glove changes to match the shape of the hand. This is similar to what we'd expect from an enzyme that interacts with the substrate through an induced fit mechanism. So which model is true? Well, it depends on the enzyme. Most enzymes are probably closer to an induced fit model, but there are some examples of uh, enzymes that interact through a lock and key mechanism as well. So as the substrate binds to the enzyme, multiple weak interactions are formed. These weak interactions include mainly electrostatic and hydrogen bond interactions. Sometimes dispersion forces are also introduced if numerous atoms are brought close enough to each other. 
these weak intermolecular forces hold the substrate in place and in the proper orientation for the reaction to occur. The complementarity in shape maximizes the number and strength of the intermolecular uh, interactions that are formed. So the enzyme isn't going around looking for the right substrate. Essentially, the enzyme can't think. It's not searching for these things. All of these interactions are random. So what would you imagine would happen if the wrong molecule came into the active site? Could we still get a reaction to occur? Well, probably not. The reaction doesn't occur instantaneously just because something enters the active site. If the wrong molecule came into the active site, it wouldn't be able to form the same set of complementary weak interactions. And therefore, that molecule would just continue to bounce around and eventually leave. Now, it's important to realize that the enzymes are speeding up reactions that would occur on their own without an enzyme. An enzyme cannot make a reaction happen that wouldn't happen in the first place. So what we need to look at then is when reactions, when would a reaction occur in the first place? What, what does it mean for a reaction to occur normally? To understand this, let's revisit collision theory. According to collision theory, reactions occur when a reactant first comes into contact with something else. It needs to come in contact with those things in the proper orientation, and they need to collide with a sufficient amount of energy to initiate the reaction. All three of these conditions need to be met before the reaction will take place. It's not enough for two particles just to collide with one another. Anything that increases the probability of one of these conditions being met will speed up the reaction. Enzymes directly affect two of these three conditions, and they make the third condition more possible in order to speed up chemical reactions. So they use intermolecular forces to bring substrates together in an optimal orientation and proximity. In this way, they increase the concentration of substrate within the microenvironment of the enzyme's active site. The enzyme also stabilizes transition states. Let's consider a reaction coordinate diagram. The transition state is the highest energy species within a reaction pathway. So as we proceed from substrates to products, we're going to pass through the transition state. In biochemical reactions, this double dagger symbol is used to indicate this highest energy position or the transition state structure. Enzymes stabilize this structure thereby lowering the amount of energy needed to initiate the reaction. And that makes the reaction more probable. Therefore, more molecules would have sufficient energy to react and the reaction can proceed faster. They do this by providing a different mechanism for the reaction through a lower energy pathway. We'll call this our catalyzed. Oops reaction versus our uncatalyzed. So how do enzyme substrate interactions stabilize the transition state? Remember that at any time a bond or an interaction is formed, energy is released. When multiple weak interactions form between an enzyme and its substrate, energy is released in the form of binding energy. The lower the energy of the substrate, the more stable it is, and the more energy is released. Only the correct pairing of an enzyme and its substrate with the correct alignment between the weak interactions can stabilize and maximize the amount of binding energy. This accounts for the specificity of the enzyme-substrate interaction that we discussed earlier. However, the full complement of weak interactions is actually only formed when the substrate's converted into the transition state. In other words, the enzyme's active site is not necessarily complementary to the substrate, but to its transition state, with which the enzyme forms now its full complement of weak force interaction, 
and therefore releases the maximum amount of binding energy. The energy that's released as multiple weak interactions are formed, lowering the energy of the transition state, thereby stabilizing it, and therefore lowering the activation energy requirement for the reaction. It's important to note that enzymes increase the rate of the chemical reaction, but they don't change the equilibrium constant. This is a really important point. Essentially what I'm saying is that the enzymes can speed up a reaction that's already thermodynamically favorable, but it can't make a reaction spontaneous if it wasn't spontaneous in the first place. The equilibrium constant K and whether the reaction is thermodyn thermodynamically favorable depends on only the initial and final conditions of the reaction, meaning the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products. Note that in the catalyzed reaction mechanism drawn in the energy diagram, the energy of the substrate and the energy of the products haven't changed. We know that we can determine the change in free energy of a reaction by comparing the energy of the products to the energy of the substrates. By subtracting the, the free energy of products from or minus the free energy of reactants, we get our change in free energy for our reaction. If the products are more stable than the reactants, then they're lower in energy and the delta G is negative and the reaction would be thermodynamically favorable. If the products are less stable than the reactants, then they're higher in energy, delta G is positive and the reaction is not thermodynamically favorable. We can also use the equilibrium constant to indicate if a reaction is thermodynamically favorable or not. The standard change of free energy will indicate if a reaction is spontaneous under certain conditions. One important note about biological systems here is that under standard conditions, all aqueous species are present in one molar concentrations. However, if we had a one molar concentration of hydrogen ions, we would end up with a system that has a pH of zero. Biological species would never operate under that pH. So we define our standard conditions in biological systems at a pH that's closer to biological values. So we'll call this, instead of delta G, we call this delta G not prime. The prime indicates that we're talking about the standard change in free energy at a pH of seven. However, we're rarely under standard conditions. Therefore, the non-standard change in free energy will actually describe if the reaction is spontaneous under these more common conditions. The non-standard change in free energy is related to the standard change in free energy delta G naught prime through this modifying factor. R is our universal gas constant. T is temperature and then natural log of products over reactants. The non-standard delta G really depends on two things. The nature of the reactants, that's described or characterized by this delta G naught prime value. And therefore then the concentration of reactants and products could also uh, manipulate our non-standard change in free energy. At equilibrium, the non-standard change in free energy, delta G would be zero. And the ratio of products to reactants at equilibrium would be described by the equilibrium constant K. Therefore, we have a relationship between delta G and K. If K is greater than one, that indicates that products are favored over reactants at equilibrium, and the reaction is going to proceed spontaneously in the forward direction towards products. If K is less than one, then the reactants are favored at equilibrium, and the reaction will be non-spontaneous and proceed in the reverse direction towards reactants. While your body can't alter the nature of the reaction, it can alter the conditions of the reaction. It does this by manipulating the ratio of products to reactants. By manipulating this ratio, we can augment a, under standard conditions, a non-spontaneous reaction to become standard under non-standard conditions, or to become spontaneous, sorry, under non-standard conditions. A common strategy that your body uses is that it will use the product of one reaction as the reactant in a subsequent reaction. This ensures that the product concentration from the first reaction is, is kept perpetually low. And as a result, it's going to force the reaction to continue to produce product 
and continue to drive that reaction forward. So your body can manipulate the thermodynamics of the reaction to ensure that it's a spontaneous reaction. However, the speed at which that reaction occurs does not depend on the final or initial states of the reaction. Instead, it depends on the mechanism or the pathway from reactants to products. Consider taking a trip from New York to Los Angeles. The, the distance between those two cities isn't changing. However, even though the distance is constant, the time that it takes you to get from one city to the next depends on the path that you take to get there. Same thing is happening within our reactions. By changing the reaction pathway, we can actually proceed from substrate to product at a faster rate. By stabilizing the transition state, enzymes alter the pathway from substrate to product by lowering the activation energy requirement, thereby increasing the probability of collisions with sufficient energy, therefore speeding up the reaction. Interestingly, enzymes increase the speed of both the forward and reverse reactions. Therefore, enzymes do not affect the final amount of product that's being formed or the ratio of product to reactant present at equilibrium. In other words, they don't change the equilibrium constant K. This is a common misconception. Many people think that enzymes or catalysts generally increase the amount of product that's gonna be produced. No, they increase the rate at which product is made, but they can't make any more product than would have otherwise been made by the uncatalyzed reaction. They're just making it faster. So let's return one last time to collision theory. Reactions occur when the reactants collide in the right orientation and with sufficient energy to initiate the reaction. And enzymes affect the orientation and the energetics of the reactions. But for the most part, they can't make substrates come together any faster. How fast do the substrates come together to, to form the enzyme substrate complex is generally determined by diffusion. We're waiting for the enzyme and the substrate to move through the cell to come into contact with one another. Therefore, the rate of the enzyme catalyzed reactions cannot be faster than the rate of the diffusion controlled encounter of the enzyme to the substrate. Enzymes that proceed at a rate of diffusion are said to have achieved catalytic perfection, or they're known as kinetically perfect. Essentially, that means that as the substrate enters the active site, it's quickly turned into product and released, and a new substrate molecule can come in. And therefore, the only limiting factor in terms of the rate of the reaction is the diffusion or the speed at which that substrate can actually come into the enzyme. Interestingly, though, some enzymes proceed faster than the diffusion control limit. How is that possible? There are a couple possibilities. I'll start with my favorite. Uh, there may be electrostatic forces that attract the enzyme and substrate, essentially pulling them together faster than would be expected if they encountered themselves only through diffusion. This is known as the Circe effect. Circe was a Greek goddess who lured Odysseus's men to her house and then turned them into pigs. Essentially, enzymes are doing the same thing. The enzyme is using electrostatics to lure in the substrate and turn it into product. A second strategy is the formation of enzyme complexes in which the product of one enzyme is channeled directly into the next enzyme in the complex. And therefore, we don't need to wait for diffusion for our enzyme to travel from one medium to the next. In multiple ways, enzymes are influencing the rate at which our chemical reactions are occurring in the body to make sure that you're able to produce all of the things you need to survive. And that is the end of what I have prepared.